Everybody. Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome our guest, Coach Jack Roach. Coach Roach, you have coached in a variety of capacities in American swimming. You have a long storied coaching career. You are one of the people that many of our national team alumni have on their short list of phone calls when they need to go over something, when they need advice you seem to be the person that they often go to most of everybody. We are so thankful that you carved out some time today. We're gonna to have a discussion today just based on what we think makes coaches great and some of the qualities and characteristics that go into developing what a great coach is and what a great coach becomes. And so I think the best way to start a conversation is what are some of the things that you think about first and foremost when we think about what makes a good leader, a good leader coach. Yeah, you know, Mike, I, I think what we're talking about here is, is the art of coaching. And in, in addition, I, I, I look at it, it's more expansive than that. It's really the art of living a, a, a productive life where you're, you're, you're making the most of, you know, when I think of great qualities in coaching, it's building relationships. And the willingness to, to care. How far are you willing to care? Are, are you willing to care this much? But mm, I don't know about this much. And when the, the other part of the art of coaching or becoming a great coach, I, I think there are two qualities that I look for or I see constantly in great coaches. And one is, is passion and I, I use that term, I don't necessarily like that term because it's used so often, but it's a love for whatever you're doing. So if we, if we do use the term passion, it's a great love for what you're doing. And, and then the other is perseverance. I, you, you are going to be exposed on every single level you can possibly imagine if you stay in this sport long enough. You know, the, the, the ability to focus on when things are tough, the ability to focus on times when things are boring, the ability to reach in and work hard when it just doesn't feel like you have the energy to do it. I, th there's no one listening to your program or, or this podcast, if they are coaching, that haven't experienced all those things. Those emotions are really challenging. And as a young coach, when you're learning to handle disappointment, developing strategies to overcome that or to have the wherewithal to understand that it's part of a developmental process takes time. So in your experience, when you see some of these great coaches, what do they do really well when they're going through those challenging moments? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would focus in on that perseverance uh, term. I, I just, I, I do believe that every one of them have a strong philosophy. They know themselves and it's, it seems to be clarity and the ability to establish these uncompromising principles that they know will get them to where they feel like they need to go in order to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And, that's kind of a wordy answer to, it, it goes back to caring, you know, how much are you willing to care? And, and, and seeing the, the people that we all know, the Eddie Reese's, the John Urbanchek's, the people that I levitated towards, they, they, have, this, they have this kindness about them and, and this just uncompromising uh, ability to, to stay the course and stay very, very even keeled and continue to push out that principle that they st so strongly believe in that, you know, it just doesn't waver, it doesn't waver. I was talking to you one time when I was younger and it was in Colorado Springs. And you said to me, every young coach needs to be able to write their life philosophy as it relates to swimming. And 
that was really empowering for me. Talk about why that's so important for coaches to understand that. Yeah, I, I, I truly believe that there are only two things that shape our lives and that's people and events. And if, if you sat down and you wrote 50 people in your life that have impacted your life, it, it, it is a practice that I, I, I was part of the ISL and I had all the LA Current kids do this. They, they wrote down the 50 most influential people in their lives. And, and from there, you start to understand exactly what you stand for. If, if you do not know who you are and what you stand for, it, it's relatively rare to be able to live in the, in the present moment. And I, I don't believe you will be reaching your full potential or anything really special happens, magical. It, Nothing magical happens if you aren't living in the present moment. That ability to stop time and not have the past and not have the, the future uh, interfering with the way you're conducting what you're doing at that moment, is it's just pretty special. And I think it takes a combination of being confident in who you are and you that doesn't happen consistently until you know who you are and what you stand for. I really appreciate that exercise. And that's something that I think I'm going to take our staff through because I think understanding ways that we can relate to our athletes and build those relationships are first going to be based on the understanding of ourself. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I just don't, I, it, until you do the really hard inner work, sitting down and starting to write down all the impact, all the people who have influenced your life. The, the events that have influenced your life, you, you can almost start to create this book that's a chapter, chapter by chapter and go, yes, this really led me to start to think this way. No, this wasn't that important. And, you know, if you, if you do that and it's an exercise where you go back and you reflect on it, and I don't think it ever stops. I'm, I'm 74 years old and I try to start every morning with meditation and journaling for about a half an hour that I, I can reflect on the day or the week or the month. And, you know, this past year, certainly the impacts it's made on me as a person and, and how, how that affects my thought process. I think when we have that understanding, it, it increases our ability to be productive, not simply from an athletic standpoint, but from a whole self-awareness category. Talk to me about when you journal those thoughts and when you're taking stock of what you're going through, what does that help you do for the next thing you need to accomplish? Well, you know, I, when I encourage young kids to, to start to journal and we, we talk about it, I, I found that uh, when I reflect back on my journal, I can see a pattern in my life where I'm struggling and I can almost, I can look back at what created that struggle based on my thoughts during that time. And I can quite often stop a struggle that's getting ready to happen from happening. So I almost believe journaling is, is a way to reflect back and not make the same mistakes twice. I, I also use the journal in conversation with athletes, one-on-one -on -one or, or groups, that I, I, you know, it's, it's almost a way to tell stories because you're talking about your life and how the chapters of your life were written and the people and the events that impacted those. And uh, yeah, it's just so rich. I, it's, there's, I don't think you can place a value on understanding how you got to where you are and, and what those, uh, those different relationships were in life at the time. You know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And really what we're getting to here is the idea or the process of becoming our authentic selves. And you mentioned a couple coaches a minute ago, you know, you mentioned Eddie. When we think of Eddie Reese, 
you know, I think of him as such an authentic person, the way that he relates to his athletes, the way he motivates people. But you said to me one time that becoming authentic is one of the greatest accomplishments that we can achieve in our life. And one way to do that is through these self analytics. So how are we becoming more aware that we're getting closer to that point? Yeah, I, I, I guess there's, there, there's more than one way to do that. But you know what I find that I find if, if I'm having an honest conversation and while I'm doing that, number one is I'm able to stay in the present moment. And I have no fear of other people's opinions. That's what, that's what kids run away from. That's what adults will run away from. Me too. You know, that, that's the big dinosaur in our life in this day and age. It's the fear of other people's opinions. And you, you watch decisions made. You, you look at actions taken when people are in a situation that they're afraid of failing. And the greatest, I, I think the greatest impact of that fear of failing is you're worried about how other people are going to feel about you if you fail. It, it changes your outlook on the way you want to be viewed. And I, I, I me too, right? I, I don't want to fail because of that at times. And yet, the fear of failure holds you back from becoming better than you are now. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And, you know, I, I struggle with that. I certainly understand how a, a, a 12, 13, 14, 15, 20, 22, 23 year old struggles with it. We, we want to run from that. And it, it's almost easier to fail. Well, it is. It's easier to fail knowing that you decided to fail on your own than to really go for it. it it's, that's strange to me, but it's true. You see it all the time. And we see that, and those that are listening at, at home or in the car or traveling, we see that with our athletes, right? We see that there is that fear. It's very fair to say that as coaches, we have that fear too. We want to fit in with who we consider the best coaches. We don't want to make certain mistakes. We're worried about making evolution within our programs or our programmatic philosophy. So we have fear too, as leaders of our teams. How have you seen that manifest itself over the years when you're helping to guide coaches make positive changes? Yeah, you, you know, we are, again, we're talking about, about, about authenticity, right? And I, I, I think that here, I, here's what happens when you start to worry about other people's opinions. Fundamentally, are you setting your life up to see how much you can accomplish? Or are you setting your life up to try not to fail? Because if you're starting to set your life up to try not to fail, then you're going to have all these excuses like it, that it just does not work. You will not reach your full potential if you set your life up not to fail. Where if, if you're trying to see what you can accomplish, that's such a free feeling. You know, you'll do whatever it takes to reach your goal. And if you're, yeah, if you're, if you are trying not to fail, it's, there's excuse after excuse after it, you start to worry about what might happen. And athletes, especially this day and age who are, who might be much more aware of, you know, a coach's emotional state in a practice or the athletes these days are very, very intelligent and able to catch on to those things. And if you're putting yourself in a position where you're worried all the time and that anxiety is building up in you as a coach or a set doesn't go the right way, you know, those are things that we really have to be mindful of. And when you think about some of the best practitioners in our profession, do you know some of the strategies that they use when you know, they feel those anxious moments at practice or inside of a season or a three-day meet where things are kind of getting out of hand and they're lost, right? We might not have the skill set to handle what's happening in front of us. Who's a, and we don't need specific examples, but what do you notice about those types of coaches who are able to compartmentalize and stay with, uh, stay in the moment? 
Yeah, it comes back a little bit to philosophy, but I, I think it's deeper than that. I, I, uh, I, I can't remember at what point, but it was pretty late in my life. I came to realize that I could not tell anyone something. I could not give them advice that they did not already possess. And I think this is regardless of age. I, and, and when I say that, what I mean by that is if you're asking the right questions, if you have a community around you to allow for failure and you start to ask the right questions, that young person or that person will come up with the solution on their own. You can, you can foster that, but I, I believe that a place where coaches get into the biggest, biggest challenges are when they start to tell kids what they think they need to hear. I just, I, I don't believe that's a good idea. I, well, I know it's not, it doesn't work for me. And I, I would challenge people or a coach to ask themselves, how often do they say you need to do this or I want you to, it's hard not to do it. I'm so aware of that and I have trouble not doing it. But if, if you really wanna watch a young person grow and become the person that they feel they won't become authentic, then start to ask them questions that help them ask themselves questions. When we talk about understanding our relationship with failure, both as leaders of our teams uh, and, and as athletes, you said to me once that maybe after a poor performance, there should be two main questions that you ask your athlete. And the first one was, were you unwilling? And will you, were you unable? And then, then there was a tree from that. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you got to that, how you got to that as a, a key source of information in that relationship? Yeah, I, I believe that, that clarity is, is the best way to approach uh, challenges when there's tension in the air. I mean, I guess it's the best way to approach anything, to be as clear and as simple as you can. And, you know, I think, likely in a let's let's take a big competition i think it i think those two terms apply anywhere but let's take a real a, a competition where there's a lot at stake for both coach and athlete or at least it seems like it at the time in reflection it never is right but uh i i the the first 15 or 20 seconds that a coach has in a discussion with a young person at that time I believe it can impact that relationship for the rest of that time together. Certainly if the stakes are that high to both of them, and, and probably you're talking about getting into adolescent years at that point. And, and it, to me, if you've, if you've set up the framework to have a conversation after someone fails, it has to be, it has to be specific, like, if if you're if you're asking them were they were they un, were they unwilling or were they say the two again I'm a little bit I I know that wait hold on a second were you unwilling or unable if they were unable that's a discussion that's really easy to have you can start to look back on the way you as a coach and them as an athlete prepared for the race they physically were not able to do that if they were unwilling that gets a lot deeper. You know, what's going on in school? What's going on with your family? Relationship with teammates? Uh, something is creating the inability for them to let go and see what they can fully accomplish. There's no doubt about that. And getting the information that they give back to you, there might be a time, and you need to accept it as a coach, where the athlete says, look, I wasn't ready for this or I don't feel like I gave that my all. We often hear, I feel like I could have gone so much faster. How do we take those responses and make sure that our athletes feel validated? And yeah. that's a challenging piece. Well, it, it's very challenging for our, in our sport because I, to me, that's starting, that's a lack of confidence. And I, 
I don't believe anyone can give someone else else confidence. Only you can do the only you can build confidence in yourself. But I do believe it's up to a coach to try to set up situations, not to try, but to set up situations in practice where you are addressing specific areas that a person can accomplish something and feel better about themselves. And yet it's a daunting task. You could be a coach working with 20 people. And how do you set up a workout to address one person and still accommodate everyone? It can be done, but it, it, it requires a lot of work. And I, I also think that, you know, we're, we're starting to talk about wisdom here, which is a big part of the art of coaching, right? And wisdom, uh, wisdom doesn't, con wisdom cannot be taught or learned. It's discovered and it's self-discovered from within. And uh, for some that come, for me, it took a long time to walk into that area. I had to be much older and, you know, I didn't get into the sport until I was 40 years old. So it took me probably another 10 years after that to understand that, you know, that that's probably the greatest thing you can help a young person understand is they have the wisdom to figure that stuff out. Sort of got off topic. No, you're absolutely right, though. I mean, learning to understand that there are times where you need to give the athlete the space to handle emotions on their own and not try to micromanage the feelings of each athlete on your team is is difficult and and i think a lot of coaches are in that position this day and age because we all are so much more aware of building that relationship with our athletes but there's only so much that that we can do right i mean i i talked to you a little bit about <clears throat> learning how to give more ownership over the sport to our swimmers uh what are what are some strategies to use when we or, or what are some signs that maybe we need to step back as coaches and let the athlete handle a scenario on their own? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the biggest struggles that I've had as a coach is knowing that for someone to stop being unwilling is for me to step step back and watch them struggle with why they're unwilling and, and, and not try to fix it. As coaches, we're constantly trying to fix things that I believe stifle growth and, and yet that's that's our nurturing, you know, that's such a big part of who we are as responsible adults. But I I do uh, I I I sincerely believe that at times we interfere with with pain because we want to help when in fact it it's going to slow it down. It, you do if you can if you can watch that process and circle back around, either when things have settled down a little bit, or you know, you know, we're constantly trying to center young people that have become self-centered. Self-centered, it sounds like a, a negative term, but it's not. When people are struggling, me too, I sell, I become self-centered to protect myself. And how do, we, how do we better center somebody once they've become self-centered? You can't let it go too far. At the same time, they need to become self-centered to, to work on some, some challenges that they have individually that, you know, sometimes your best friend's like the worst person in the world to help you through a struggle. You know, they they want to tell you something that's just not true. And we see that with young people all the time. Oh, it's not your fault. Well, you know, we want people to fail forward. We want them to fail fast. We want them to fail frequently, but it's not okay to keep making the same mistake over and over again. And that's that's what happens when people start to tell people it's okay when it's not okay after they've made those mistakes so many times. When we find that those athletes finally make the breakthrough, right? And an athlete who's been struggling and in our sport, you know, you could go for a very long time without maybe having a lifetime best performance, but you continue to race and you continue to progress in many other ways, but there will be a breakthrough if the athlete wants there to be, if it's, if it's intrinsic, uh, how do we stay patient as coaches in that process? And, and for us at the club level, I'm constantly working with parents, uh, 
on, on my own learning, but also with families learning to stay patient and understand that it's a process oriented sport. And those aren't the easiest lessons to learn uh, or to teach. Yeah, yeah, Mike, you know, quite often if uh, we lose someone by possibly overtraining them physically, then at some point you've addressed the physical, but it's been going on for so long that the mental becomes the challenge. And, you know, there, as a human being, there are only three things we can train. Uh, it's the body, the mind, and our craft. And we seem to be able to measure the what's going on in the craft when you're working on different skills. You can go, okay, they're, they're lacking this or they're lacking that. And Certainly with the body, you know, you, you've got heart rate, you've got times, you've got tempo, you've got all the stuff that you, but you can't measure the mind. And uh, it requires, you, you have to learn the learner. You absolutely have to be relentless when it comes to asking questions. And I go back to caring. How much are you willing to care? Quite often, you see the same mistake being made over and over again. And no matter what you say, it doesn't seem to work. Well, are you willing to dig in and just keep asking that question over and over again, hearing the same answer over and over, over, and over again? That's where caring comes in. And it, you have to care just as much a month later as you did when it first started happening. And it's, it's, it's difficult to do. But it, it, and they have to know that you care. They have to see that it's sincere. That pursuit, in my opinion, is really what separates some of the coaches that cultivate those wonderful relationships with their athletes and those coaches who, who struggle to, to find that level of understanding. And it doesn't separate good coaches from bad, but it's a really uh, difficult process to stay that persistent. And I think, you know, as, as young coaches are, are learning and growing in the sport, continuing to find the ways that make your individual athletes get excited about making changes or developing some resiliency or changing the way that they look at their own journey in the sport, that's where the good stuff is. But Talk about why it's so important to keep driving and, and striving to learn, because there are many coaches out there that continuously do the same thing year after year after year, and, and then might not be happy with the results they're getting. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that, that I have the answer for that. I, I, I do know that it, there probably comes a time in everyone's career where they need to reevaluate what they're doing and how they're doing it. I, you see good coaches out there and you see bad coaches out there and, and it doesn't necessarily dictate performance. You know, bad coaches have people that swim well and good coaches have people that swim well. But, you know, it, when, when, when I listen or I observe a coach starting to get negative, uh, or angry, that that works for a little while, but it doesn't work for any length of, of time. It just does, it doesn't fly. It, it's too, it's, it's, it's just too, it, it just creates too much in, like adrenaline. It creates too much cortisol. You know, you can, you can get someone's attention if you stick a pointed stick in their eye or you, you start to yell at them, but it, you know, what, what are you really doing? My goodness, it's, and I, I think that I, I see, I see that going on, not a lot, but you see it going on. And quite often, if, if I don't know the coach, I, I wouldn't know how to sit down and, and talk to them, but that, that is where we need each other. That's, you know, I, I have had those conversations with coaches and I've had coaches have those conversations with me, but it, it requires a little bit of time in the sport and having created relationships that uh, support one another when things get tough. How important is it coach to respect what the athlete is trying to get out of the sport 
rather than trying to frame whether positively or negative what you would like to get out of that athlete either for your team or trying to reach parent expectations why is it so important and this is especially true i think with the collegiate and and postgraduate athletes and professionals why is it so important for coaches to respect their athletes path in the sport or what the athlete is trying to accomplish yeah it it really goes back to i i don't believe i can tell anyone what they what they need to do I, I believe that all i can do is sit down and talk to them about about them and, and try try my best to understand enough to help guide them I, you know there you look at when you talk about a personal philosophy if, if you don't have one then you don't have you are not going to react to certain situations in a way that you're going to fall back on who you are as a person and let those thoughts turn into action and be able to keep moving forward. It, it, get, it goes back to how well do you really know yourself, meaning you and the athlete. And there's there has to be a large degree of trust built. I really believe that when I was the national junior team director and I was with the national team, that I was allowed a luxury that quite often the home coach didn't have. I did not have the emotional, uh, the, the emotional like, I don't know whether it's emotion or I, I didn't have the same thing at risk that they had. And that can at times become volatile because they both want it so badly. And being able to sit down and understand why someone wears the clothes they wear, why they listen to the music they listen to, they drive the car they drive, they brush their teeth with the tooth, toothpaste they, they brush with. That's their culture, that's their philosophy. But how do you help them understand that those things, all those things are part of who they are and how do they best understand what that philosophy is and utilize it to move forward in a positive way? It takes a lot of you have to know someone and you don't know someone if you aren't asking questions, you just don't. You know, we're, I, talk to, I talk to athletes all the time about every day when they walk into a workout, when they go through that gate at the fence or the door into that building, they're not the same person they were yesterday and neither are any of their teammates. What are you doing to really find out what's going on in their lives? What happened between yesterday and today? Obviously, you don't have a lot of time to do that. But as an adult, as a coach, you can watch body language. You can look at someone, grab them as soon as you can, and start to have those conversations before a day turns into a week and a week turns into a month. Really and truly, the most productive times I believe on connection with an athlete or the 15 minutes or a half an hour before practice and that time after practice. You, If you're standing on deck waiting on people to get ready, I, I don't believe you're doing your job. So important, the, that little portal of time that you get to, to make some of those connections. And we're talking about that more and more, thankfully, in the coaching profession. Coach, when you look back and at your time as the national junior team director and working with the national team, you, you had access to some of the best young athletes in the world. What were some of those commonality, the, the characteristics that would later lead some of those athletes to become a part of our, our national team and uh, our Olympic team? What are some of the things that you can say you know, these kids had in common, even though, even though they're all so very unique and what drives them is very unique. Yeah, I, probably the, the first quality, Mike, that jumps out in my mind is they're optimistic. They, they believe no matter what, they're going to figure it out. I mean, when, when the framework of who they are as an athlete starts to crumble in performance, they have the ability to believe that there's a reason for that going on and it's not going to stop them from getting to where they want to go. And I, and I also believe that ability to drop into direct perception where, again, once again, 
there's no there's no past and there's no future there's a lot of space in their head when things are hostile that allow them to slow things down their thoughts down and you know the, the word tension it's there for a reason right when you start to panic there's no space between your thoughts. You're just like, it is tension and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And, and the real good ones, they, they can slow themselves down and you can literally watch them working through something that probably is impossible for most, but not them. I mean, they, they, they're optimistic. They just believe they're going to figure it out. That, that's the greatest quality. And, you know, they're, they're mentally tough. And when I talk about mental toughness, I think the best definition I've ever heard for that, it, for, for that term is that when everything's going wrong, what's the next most important thing? Just go to the next most important thing. You aren't going to change what just happened. What's next? What's next? And what's next? And guess what? The next most important thing might not work out, but don't stop. What's next? We celebrate that in sport. We see it in pictures all the time. You know, the, the Tom Brady's that in the second half, just I don't care how far behind we are. What's next? What's next? What's next? Michael Phelps, fourth place in the 400 IM in London. What's next? 200, the relay, second place. What's next? 200 fly, second place. What's next? Next four events, four gold medals. I mean, that is mental toughness. And, and that, is a learn, that is a behavior that can be taught. I think some people are born with it uh, a little bit stronger than others, but it is, a, it is a, a learned ability. And it's up to us. We, we, went, we talked earlier about watching people struggle. Don't necessarily prevent them from doing that. I think the daunting task of teaching mental toughness is you can't really start to work on it until things go bad. And then people don't want to be taught when things go bad. And, and yet that's when you stand up and you go after it with them. I mean, I, I really enjoy those times. They are hard, but I can see such great change. And, you know, that's, we all know how physically tough the sport is. And we, and we know how mentally tough it is, but you better have a definition for mental toughness and you better start to shape it early. And I'm so glad that you shared that because it, it resonates so true. And, and with some of the, the athletes that we've been fortunate to work with, you know, it, you, you see that and you see those learned abilities and, and you understand that, that force that just gets them to think about what do I have to do next in order to overcome this? One thing that Coach Marsh shared with me a couple of weeks ago was, I said, you know, what, what's a mistake that a lot of coaches make, whether they've been in their career for a long time or they're starting out? He said, you know, there's a tendency sometimes when you have a high energy athlete, an athlete who's very social, to try to tamp them down sometimes. And especially when they're younger, because younger boys, especially, they have that energy. You know, they, they're coming in and we want to kind of tamp them down, calm them down. Why is it important to you know, let those athletes know that, that some of that is really healthy behavior that's going to help them be successful. We need to learn to mitigate it and, and throttle it back and forth sometimes. But why is it important for us as coaches to recognize those types of things might be a positive piece to this athlete's development? And by trying to tamp it down, we might really hinder their ability to grow in the sport. Yeah, you know, I, I love uh, a positive deviant. <laughs> those, those, those kids that want to walk out on that limb as far as they can go and it breaks, I, I honestly, I celebrate them. But you do have to be cautious with the impact it might make on the rest of the team. But absolutely, I mean, you know, it's like, do you want to harness a wild horse? I don't think so. I, uh, I, yeah, I, I somehow I align with them very well, and I, I don't really struggle with that very much. But I, I do think that because we work with so many people individually, that you have a tendency to want discipline over uh, uniqueness, and and that's. Uh, I would, I couldn't agree with Dave more. I, I just believe that, you know, that they're, they're a disruptor and, you know, the, but how do you like, how do you direct that disruptor the right way? Because they, they can 
create chaos at the same time, chances are they're going to be your those guys that do walk out on that limb and, and really achieve something that's pretty special. Coach, when you were walking on deck, you know, at, at any of the club teams that you worked with uh, or any of the teams that you worked with, and even as the national junior team, what were you most excited about when you were on your way to practice? What was something that you were thinking in your thought process? You know, I'm excited to see how this athlete reacts to this set or how this re athlete reacts to what challenges we went through yesterday. What were some of those things that you were excited about when you were on your way to practice? Yeah, you know, I, I really believe that if, if I, I am so driven by relationships and the deeper I can take those relationships, the, the more value I believe that you share with the people that you care about and have meaning in your life. And it's very interesting at, at the age of 74, I, I find that I have gone from the mentor and, and the teacher to someone who's being mentored and taught by those people. I, I spent a great deal of time in Indianapolis last weekend with Anthony Irvin, and he's one of those people that we've traveled internationally together for since he came back into the sport. And, and I, you know, I listened to him and I learned from him. And these young people, if you allow them, they give you a relevance that allows you to, to grow and be a better person and growth. I mean, the, the mentorship, it has nothing to do with who's older than who. It's, it's that mutual respect and that deep relationship. You know, there, there's only one thing that prevents a relationship from going deep, and that's lack of trust. The, the more that you can engage with someone, the more that someone sees that you deeply care, it creates a trust that has such great impact on your ability to accomplish whatever that particular goal is. I, it doesn't happen without support. It, there's not, every sport's a team sport, every single one of them. And it's all based on the deep relationships that are established through one thing, and that's trust. And if you can establish trust with someone, the conversations that go on between you and that person become so deep that the, their potential is, is reached. It's just reached, and it doesn't happen without that. That's, that's, that's such a great point. And, and getting to that point takes time. And we, and we have to be patient also to know when to push to learn more and when to allow that to come to us. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a learned skill in coaching. Uh, we're going to move into some quick fire questions now, coach. And these are kind of specific to you. I, I had to mix up the usual ones just because I thought their relevance wasn't that important in this episode. Uh, we talked about a little bit about mental toughness and, and my question, you already answered it, but if you want to elaborate, please do. Mental toughness can be taught learned and developed true or false true yeah yeah we yeah, talked I mean, about that for sure it's a bill it's an ability that we can teach and you know again i do believe some people are born with it a little bit stronger than others but i I've, I've seen it taught i've seen it work why is physical fitness so important in the life of a coach I, it's it, you know, it, it, that does seem to be true. I think if you aren't physically fit, you limit your ability to spend time with people. I, I can't tell you how many runs I've been on with national and national junior team athletes. And for me, running is a mindful practice. If I'm outdoors and I'm in movement, I, I'm, I'm much sharper. It, it doesn't mean that you can't do it if you aren't physically fit, but I, I, we're in a very unique time where we're starting to understand the importance of the body and the mind coming together. The, the ancient wisdoms are coming back, right? And all of those are based on sound body and mind. I, I would just encourage everyone, everyone to start to look at that. I, I had a talk with a young, a young coach last week on, on just that, you know, it, and I, it, it's one that it's very, you know, it's a little bit tricky. I don't judge people by their physical condition, but I, 
for me, it would have been a limitation. Do swimmers actively in, in or, or coaches throughout their life involved in the sport, have you seen positivity out of athletes and coaches who try to create some spirituality with the water? Yeah, I mean, if, if you were to spend any time with Aaron, Aaron Pearsall, he will tell you that all that he ever wanted to accomplish in the sport of swimming was to see how deep he could take his relationship with the water. And he and I have become very good friends and I go surfing with him and he will stay in the water 12 hours a day. I mean, he, he will just go in the water and tumble around in it. He, he has a relationship with the water that when you look at what he did as an athlete and then you watch him in the water as a surfer or body surfer, you go, of course, <laughs> yes. So yeah, I mean, how deep can you take that relationship with the water? When you think about the sport of swimming and how, how much time and effort you have to put into it, quite often by the time a young person's 18 years old, it's the deepest relationship they have with anything. They've spent more time with it than any person. And, and they get disappointed in that relationship. Understanding that relationship with the water impacts them in a good and a bad way. Yes. A relationship with the water is absolutely essential. They all have it. Help them identify it. I love it. All right. Last question today, Coach. What has you most excited about the sport of swimming right now, where we are in contemporary times? I, I just absolutely love the young minds in the sport. They, they're hunting for easier ways to do things. And that doesn't mean it takes less work. It means you're maximizing the time you have to create the results that probably took a lot longer to get before. Like I, I often would wonder if what I was doing was, was I doing it so I could justify my job or was I doing it because it was the right thing? And I love the fact that it's interesting because now the young kids have the, ex, they don't have the experience, but they have the knowledge. And it's like you talk to them and you go, wow, I wish I had known that, or I certainly wish I had known it at your age, but then you, you wonder how it's gonna be implemented in time, right? And I, 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 I'm not sure how that happens and I'm, I probably diverted from your question, but that's kind of the way I operate. I, I'm glad because it reminded me that I had another question and, and how excited are you about professional swimming and the ISL and the potential for growth in, in in that realm of our sport. Yeah, you know, Budapest for me was one of the best experiences I've ever had in the sport. And it's it's because I, I, I had the opportunity to be with a group of people for a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner. And uh, the, the idea of watching all these foreign athletes, athletes come together and spend time together in a way that could have never, ever happened had it not been for the, the and, and I honor what we went through, I understand how tough it was, but it would have never happened without the pandemic. And to, to spend, to see 400 athletes, three or 400 athletes spend six weeks together, I have to believe they walked away much better athletes, but even better people. And I, you know, that's just, that needs to be celebrated. That, that doesn't happen at international competition. You're in the competition and then you're gone and you're with that team and that's where you should be. But the idea that they could engage and interact together for six weeks was pretty special. Well, coach, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we are so thankful that you joined us on the Fitter and Faster Coach's Corner. And uh, I look forward to our paths crossing again, hopefully in person soon in a couple of weeks. Are you going out to Omaha? I am. Uh, John Urbanchek and I will be out there the last four days. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And I hope we'll be on deck and, and interacting so we can catch up. But we really appreciate your time. And is the, uh, is the water warm enough down there yet to surf without a wetsuit? Uh, I went body surfing yesterday and I had to do a little running in between and laying on the warm sand during session. So maybe three waves out laying on the sand, three waves out laying on the sand, but 
it's warming up. We're probably in the high 50s right now, and it'll warm up pretty quickly. Well, nice. Coach, thank you so much, and uh, hope to see you soon. Mike, I certainly hope that this conversation honored what you're trying to accomplish, and, and thanks for this opportunity. Thank you.